so I'm Katie Anderson. For those of you who I have not had an opportunity to meet or talk with, um, I am one of the founding owners here at Aperion. And we are gonna go through our board basics today. Really the intention of today's session is to give you a really quick overview of what does it mean to be on a board and what is, uh, you know, really what is an association? How are they formed? And what's the general structure of them to provide you with the basics for how you navigate your volunteerism with your association. So throughout today, we're going to talk a bit about your role, our role as management, owner's roles. Um, we're going to provide you with some resources on hierarchy of governing documents and how to navigate decisions as a board member with those documents. So if you have questions, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask questions. You're also welcome to use the chat function for any um, questions that may come up. I'll try and answer them throughout the session. We'll also provide you with an opportunity towards the end to um, ask questions as well if you're not comfortable uh, asking them throughout the session. So let's dive into the purpose of a community association. Why are they formed and really what is their charge? You'll hear our managers um, you know, use the words that you are a corporation, you're a business, you're running a business. And the purpose of a community association is to build community, to run the business functions of that corporation and to act as sort of a governing body for your community. And that can look really different for different communities. And it's really going to depend on what your governing documents say um, as to the specificity for each of these areas. But the, the basics of why communities exist and why community associations exist are really these three fundamental uh, sort of themes. And within that, there are some different types of communities. So we have, uh, you know, you'll from time to time hear us say that it is not always as simple as looking at a building to know what type of community you might be. We really do have to go back to the governing documents and take a look at where those citations to the Oregon statutes, are you a planned community or are you a condominium? And so the most common type of community association in Oregon really or a central organ really is planned communities. These are your single family dwellings that are generally not attached and has some level of common element. And that common element can be parks, it can be pools, it can be monument signs, planting strips, it could be a clubhouse, it could be all sorts of, uh, you know, various sizes and shapes of what that common area is. But essentially, your community is acting as a quasi municipality to make sure that those common areas are taken care of. It could be roads. So you, in some instances, you're sort of taking the role of the city or of the county and taking care of those elements, raising funds and maintaining them for your community. So planned community is sort of the most common, but we are starting to see, especially with density on the rise here in Central Oregon, we are starting to see more condominiums. Areas like um, Sun River have a fair amount of condominiums, and you're, you tend to see these in bigger cities, but as Ben grows and the need for housing diversity grows, we're seeing more condominiums. And the condominium um, kind of has its own definitions. Essentially, in most instances, they're attached product. So they're either going to be a stacked product like the pictures you see here, or they can be, you know, sort of side by side in sort of a townhome fashion, but be subject to a condominium regulation. But the condominium definition essentially says that an owner really owns their airspace, that interior piece of the unit, and an undivided interest in the common elements. And the common elements are generally sort of from that finished surface of the dwelling out it can be electrical, plumbing, exterior walls, siding, roof, windows, those types of things. And so as an owner, you own that interior space of your unit, but then you have an undivided interest with all of your other owners in those common, common elements. Other types of communities that we, we don't see them as frequently in Oregon. Um, we do have them. We don't see them as often. Uh, cooperatives, this is a, um, 
more common thing that you see in Chicago, New York, those types of things. We really don't have a lot of them here in Oregon. A lot to do with our land use regulations. Master plan, um, sort of master associations, there, there are a fair amount of these. And generally a master association, you're gonna see some type of global oversight. So the master association may have responsibility for the roads and the landscaping. And then you may have sub associations underneath that master that each may look a little different. You may have a townhome community, you may have a um, condominium community, you may have single family dwellings. And so the master- hey, so are The master is I'm set up to a in conference. order to make sure that there's someone overseeing those global assets and then the individual communities are responsible for the common elements that may be specific to their association. Uh, mixed use developments can generally be a sort of condominium project where you may have retail and commercial in, in the same area as residential. So you have multiple different types of product in that development and uh, generally different needs and different requirements for each of those. And then occasionally, uh, you know, there aren't many of these here, but um, you do see sort of deed restricted 55 and older communities. And those generally have specific requirements in the deed that someone that within the home has to be 55 or older in order to obtain a deed in that community. So those are the types of community association. So how do communities get formed? How do developers go about sort of defining the obligations and laying out the requirements for a community? There's a couple of different sources of obligation and sort of how these communities come about. But essentially, the developers decide we're gonna, we're gonna form a community, we're gonna build a single family housing community, or we're going to, we're going to build a condominium complex. And all of those um, developments start and are rooted in the Oregon statute and the land use development codes. The Oregon statutes, there's two of them that are sort of the most important in the early stages of development. And that is chapter 94, which is our Plan Community Act or chapter 100, which is our Condominium Act. And both of those areas of the statutes lay out really specific requirements for the developer when they are developing these communities. And so those obligations um, on how the community gets developed are very, are very clear. What the obligations are, what the funding are, how they set out the reserves, how they set out the budget, uh, what their special rights as a declarant are, and all of those start at the statute level and then are developed into the governing documents. And those governing documents then become sort of the roadmap and the guidelines for your community long-term. They can be amended, they can be changed by your owner or your declarant. But ultimately, that, that, that source of those um, communities start in the statute, and then that leads to the development of the governing documents. There's also lending requirements in Oregon that you'll see noted in governing documents. Frequently, those are more related to condominiums, especially if you are trying to be um, sort of Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac um, friendly, meaning that you want to be able to obtain loans through those mechanisms, there's certain guidelines that you have to meet in order for that to happen. So you may see lending requirements from a federal level that are in your governing documents that sort of specify things such as how many rentals you potentially have in the community, if they're owner occupied, um, uh, you know, how, how many of, if you have a kind of a block of owners, generally they don't like to see more than 20% of a singular owner. So if you have an investment group that owns quite a few units, sometimes that can prevent you from obtaining that type of lending. And so those are generally the sources of obligation to sort of start a community and form those initial documents. And then once those documents are formed, one important thing for you to understand as a board member is how do you work with those documents? What is the hierarchy and what's the authority of those governing documents? And on the screen here is, is specifically how the order in which those documents take precedent 
kind of a no-brainer would be that our federal statutes are going to take precedent over any of the other requirements. There is not a lot of federal statutes that pertain to our industry, but there are a few that you should be aware of. As a board member, you should be aware that the fair housing uh, federal regulations apply to you as a board member. It's important to know that we cannot discriminate or take action against an owner for any of those protected classes. The um, Freedom to Fly a Flag Act per pertains to community associations and that it is a protected right for an individual to fly the American flag. The American flag is the only thing that is protected. Um, it's not your college alma mater or, you know, if you want to fly your favorite basketball or baseball team, um, it really is only protects the American flag. And then probably a little less controversial now with kind of the shift to streaming, um, but still something that comes up from time to time is the OTARD regulations, which is the over the air um, devices, satellite dishes, which essentially says it is an individual's right to be able to obtain satellite television and that the association can't prevent or put regulations in place, which makes it difficult for that owner to obtain a signal. And um, what, what generally comes up in that instance is placement and screening and how to navigate that. And if it's something that your board is having some challenges about, we can help you navigate, but that's become a little bit less of an issue as there's been the shift to uh, streaming services and not as much satellite TV or cable TV product um, is necessary. So those are the federal regulations which mostly impact. There is also the Fair Debt Collections Act. Um, most of the compliance that happens with the Fair Debt Collections Act happens when things are turned over to the attorney, but there are some guidelines that um, we help make sure are followed with the Fair Debt Collections Act that there isn't, um, you know, sort of aggressive or violating behavior happening there as we're collecting assessments from your owners. And then you move into the state statute. As I mentioned, there are are two that help form associations. You have chapter 94 and chapter 100. And we also have chapter 65, which is the nonprofit code. And there are parts of that, depending upon your size of your community, when you were incorporated or when you were formed, there are parts of that statute that you may or may not be subject to. But chapter 65 provides us some guidance on how your board operates as a nonprofit entity here in Oregon. So there are three sort of main statutes that we refer to on a regular basis, 65, 94, and 100. And those provide some guidance when there's, you know, absent language from your governing documents or something that maybe um, isn't as clear the statutes can provide sort of some overarching guidance um, or they can step in when your documents are silent. You as a board member aren't really expected to know those statutes by heart or to uh, you know, really even navigate them. Our managers are trained and we keep them apprised of those and they'll, they will bring those resources to you. But it is always important to know um, that those exist and that those are resources because there may be times where our managers will come to you and say your governing documents say X. However, the statutes override that with this language and they'll make those recommendations to you as a board. So those are the sort of statutes that impact community associations. And then we really get into the specifics of your individual community. So the articles of incorporation are what is going to be filed to form you as a corporate entity and establish you with the state under the corporate protection. So um, each of our communities is incorporated and filed with the Secretary of State. And that provides some protection, um, especially as you, for you as individual board members that you're acting as a volunteer capacity for that corporation and not um, you know, sort of on your own or um, unprotected. So we also then, your Articles Incorporation is a really small document. It's about a page and a half. And generally, um, it doesn't provide a whole lot of detail other than the name of the corporation, where you're formed, the county in which you reside. And then you get into the governing documents. And the governing documents can be referred to as the CCNRs or the declaration or, you know, um, other maybe covenants, conditions, and restrictions, depending upon how your developer called them. 
but they're essentially that formation of the document that establishes what are the general use restrictions for your community, how are you formed, um, what architectural review control do you have, things of that nature. And then your bylaws are really going to be more so into the heart of how does your, how does your corporation run. Who's elected to your board? What are the terms? How frequently should you be meeting? Where do the meetings need to be held? What does quorum constitute? And so your governing documents, which are generally referred to as your CCNRs, are going to lay out sort of the nuts and bolts for your community. And your bylaws are sort of your operational document. And those are the extent of the recorded documents for your community. And then supplemental to those recorded documents, you're going to have some policies that are generally under the privilege of the board to potentially modify over time. So you're going to have architectural guidelines, you're going to have rules and regulations and resolutions, it could be collections resolution, electronics communications policy, um, maybe you have um, a fine policy and a compliance rule. All of those are not recorded documents. Those are things that the board has the ability to change and modify over time but they are additional rules to your community. And the important thing to understand is that they can't be in conflict. So you cannot create guidelines, policies, rules, or resolutions that conflict with your recorded document. So if there's something in your bylaws that you don't like, or if there's something in the CCNRs that you don't like, you can't create a, a rule that conflicts with that. You have to amend that provision. You can clarify. So if there's a provision in your governing documents that says, for example, um, owners can't park on the street, you could create a rule that provides some clarity to that. If the language says owners can't park, but you want to clarify that guests can park and where they can park and when they can park, you could adopt a rule that says that. But you couldn't say, um, we're going to adopt a rule that owners can park on the street. You'd have to amend your governing documents. So it's an important distinction that those resolutions and rules and policies cannot conflict with the established recorded provisions in your bylaws and your CCNRs. I will be covering open meetings um, and, and sort of the procedure for board meetings in a little bit. So some commonly used terms, um, we've covered articles of incorporation, but a plat, this is something that you may from time to time hear our managers talk about. The plat is, it, it's actually the first thing recorded after your articles of incorporation. This is gonna be sort of your lot map or in a condominium, it's gonna be you know sort of a visual picture of your building with the individual units. The plat's gonna provide some really critical details on how your communities run. It's gonna give us easement information, it's sometimes gonna tell us if there are things that other parties are responsible for, the city, or if there's another association that may be responsible for a right-of-way easement or contributing towards an easement. So those plats are important documents. Um, CCs and CCNRs and declarations, we've covered that and bylaws. Community restrictions and rules also gonna be called resolutions or policies. And you're gonna hear us talk about indemnification. So, a lot of times when we go through this training, there will be a little bit of trepidation by boards. And so you've given me all of these areas that I'm responsible for now, and now I'm kind of concerned about serving on the board. It's important to understand the structure in Oregon, and especially with the nonprofit code, you as an unpaid volunteer have indemnification. And so there, there are, specific things that you are responsible for making sure that you carry out that volunteerism in an appropriate way that's in line with your charge. Uh, you'll hear things like fiduciary duty or the business judgment rule. And what that essentially means for you as a board member is that you have to act in good faith. You need to act with the care of a ordinarily prudent person in a like position. And, and what that means is you need to, you know, listen to your experts, take their advice and make reasonable decisions and not operate in sort of self-dealing. So you're not sitting on the board um, with your own agenda, making decisions from that perspective. You are listening to those that are giving you recommendations and you're making the decision that's best for the entire community. And, and what that does is it provides 
coverage for you as an individual board member that so long as you're acting in that manner, you're indemnified and protected. And that's why we have directors and officers insurance for your community. So these are the legal charges that are laid out in the um, nonprofit code in Oregon. And fiduciary and business judgment are probably the two largest that you're going to hear most frequently. And it's important just to understand that if situation comes up or disagreements, which happens in our industry, you're telling an owner that they may or may not be able to do something that they wish to do with their property. So there's going to be a natural level of conflict potentially in what we're doing. And it's important to understand that so long as those decisions that the board is making is made in line with the best interest of the community or the corporation, there's not generally going to be a lot of second guessing the board's decision in the process. So they won't go back through and sort of, well, like, did you do every tiny little thing in the process? They'll make sure that the board um, gathered information, deliberated on that information, and then made the decision that was best in the best interest of the corporation. Confidentiality, it's important for you to understand that as a board, um, you know, you can't go share individual things about your neighbors that you may learn while you're on the board. You have access to accounting records and compliance records and things that are not widely shared in the community. That information is confidential and it extends that confidential confidentiality extends even when you're no longer on the board. Um, just when your term ends doesn't mean that you can suddenly disclose or discuss that information. It's equally as important to understand that while you're serving on the board, you are what is considered to be a party of knowledge regarding any legal issues. So if you have a um, legal uh, you know, dispute that comes up with an owner and the board is seeking legal advice, that attorney isn't representing you as an individual. They're representing the corporation and you are privileged to that information and that advice because of your role on the board. And it's important that that confidentiality with that advice be maintained. You don't want to breach that attorney-client privilege. And sometimes that's hard because if you're in litigation or stuff's going on, owners sometimes really want to know. Any information about what's released regarding legal issues really should always be ran by your attorney to make sure that whatever's being said doesn't breach any of the confidentiality um, and attorney-client privilege and put the association in a position that um, now you can't protect strategy or things of that nature. So how do the day-to-day -day operations for your community work? Uh, you know, who does what and, you know, what is needed from you as a board member? If you were to sit down and read your governing documents, what you're going to find is there's going to be a really long list in that CCNRs and sometimes in the bylaws as well that says, here's all of the things that a board member is going to do. And then there's going to be a whole section on officers that says, here's what the treasurer is going to do. Here's what the president's going to do. Here's what maybe the vice president's going to do. And here's what the secretary's going to do. And so that could be a pretty, pretty comprehensive list of here's how this community is going to run. And here's everything that this community needs to do. It doesn't necessarily mean that you as an individual board member that you have to carry out those actions. There is generally always a provision in the documents that says, here's all of the things that you're going to do. However, you have the ability to hire somebody to act on your behalf as an agent and carry out these tasks. And so if you read through that list, especially you may be the treasurer on the board, you read through that list, it's going to seem like, well, how am I supposed to establish bank accounts? And how am I supposed to make sure that, uh, you know, we're reconciling all of the records and that we're keeping um, accurate count of, you know, when people move and addresses and things of those natures. That's where we come in as a company in that we're helping you as a board comply with those legal obligations of creating your community and carrying out those tasks. And so those long lists of things that are in your governing documents, in most instances, those responsibilities get contracted away somehow. You're either hiring a management company that's carrying out those obligations, it's reconciling your books and taking in your assessments. You may be hiring a landscaper that's taking care of your obligation to maintain your common area. 
your higher net reserve provider who may be providing you with recommendations on funding obligations and maintenance recommendations. So a lot of uh, those responsibilities that are laid out in your governing documents aren't necessarily carried out by an individual board member. They're generally carried out by a professional that specializes in that area that's helping the board accomplish that work. Because again, you're volunteers and not carrying out that day to day. So in most instances, this is kind of a generalized scope of what we help do for your community. We are acting as that direct point of contact. We're taking those daily phone calls. We're responding to emails. We're helping support your board with the actions and the things that they're trying to accomplish. We're overseeing the vendors and making sure maintenance is getting done. We're driving your community, making sure compliance letters are getting sent. That scope of work is generally gonna line up with what you're responsible for as a board member in your documents. So how does that work flow? At the, the heart of it, it's important to understand that our managers don't make decisions. Our manager's job is to carry out the direction from the board. And so it's important for us to have really clear direction and policies from the board so we can carry out that day-to-day -day activity. So your board kind of sits at the top of this pyramid. You're the one that's creating the policies. You are setting the rules. You are... Um, you know, sort of directing us to communicate with owners, you're approving vendor contracts, you're approving projects, making sure that all of that stuff sort of decisions are accomplished so then our managers can carry out the day to day. So you hire the landscape vendor, our manager will then make sure that the contract is written and gets approved by the board, signed off by all parties, we keep a copy of it in your records, all of those things are facilitated by our manager, but at the heart of that is the board's decision that helps carry that forward. And so their role, our manager's role is really, you know, organizing the meetings, keeping your records, ensuring that we are staying on top of collections and overseeing, you know, vendors, all of those types of things. And in between that is requests coming in from owners. So owners are concerned about something, they're going to email our manager. If our manager has a policy or has something that the board has already laid out, then they can respond back to that owner and they can clarify that, you know, here's what the board's previously decided and here's the information that we may need from you. If it's an architectural review, you know, here's an application you have to fill out. So it's not always that every one of those owner issues is going to come back to the board if we already have direction on it. But if it's something that's new that we don't have direction on, then we very well will have to come back to the board to seek some direction and follow back up with that owner. So there's a lot of expectations, both from the homeowners, from the boards, from our managers, and sort of, you know, how does all of this stuff get done in these sort of interpersonal relationships? And so it's it, it, one of the things that we find to be really helpful is for everybody to kind of understand their role as both, uh, you know, a volunteer and a board member, but then also kind of what, what we do as well. So, um, when it comes to those inner workings with our board, we have a really clear sort of code of conduct that's laid out in our contract. And that contract says, here's how this relationship is going to work between us and the board of directors. Um, you know, approving of a single point of contact. It's really important to know that um, that single point of contact, it seems kind of silly if you have a five member board, you know, why do we need a single point of contact? Well, you can have, and, and there's a reason for this, is that we don't want our manager to get five different sets of directions. So if we have an issue that's come up, the board's met, they've made a decision, it's important then that we don't have follow-up after the meeting where they're getting emails from four or five of the board members saying, you know, I really didn't like that decision that we made at the board meeting, and I'd really prefer for you to do X. And so we set one single board um, contact and we make sure that that board contact, if there's an emergency that in between board meetings that they're the individual we're communicating with. It's really important, um, you know, that we're all agreeing to operate with a high stand, high um, standard of conduct and re respect each other's personal time. 
attending board meetings, it's really hard um, in between if you've got, you know, individuals that are missing lots of board meetings to kind of keep them apprised of the decisions. So we try to make it as efficient as possible for boards most meeting quarterly and not um, being too demanding of your time. So it's really important to have you attend those meetings and, um, you know, demonstrate mutual respect. Uh, use of Robert's Rules of Order. We have some great tools that we'll email to you after this training that are some simple sort of uh, one page documents on the use of Robert's Rules of Order. This can be a fantastic tool for helping run your meetings. But the Robert's Rules of Order really helps to make sure that you're calling the motions, that you're voting on that. So we can record the actions of the corporation in your minutes appropriately. And we don't ask that you all be parliamentarians by any mean, but just some simple tools on Robert's Rules of Order. And we'll email you a PDF following this board training along with the resources from today in the slides. Preparing for the meetings, our managers are sending the board packets in advance of the meeting. So it's really helpful when you're able to read that information um, so that you can have questions prepared, either send them to the manager before the meeting or that you are able to, um, you know, ask them at the meeting so that decisions can continue to be moved forward. And you're, you're checking off the last bullet by attending the annual, annual training. At least once a year, we ask for our board members to attend one of our trainings just kind of, um, you know, keep yourself apprised of what your responsibility and role is as a volunteer. So thank you for joining us today, checking that off. So what are some of the expectations for us as your management company? Um, you know, we're going to host regular board and committee trainings. We're going to give you the information that you need to do your job and to do it in line with uh, your governing documents and with the statutes and with federal law. Our managers are gonna make sure that they're respecting you as board members and respecting your time. Prepare for those board meetings so that you have everything that you need to make those decisions. Uh, our goal as a company is to participate in nas na national best, best practices. Uh, so our team attends a lot of trainings at a national level to make sure things are shifting. Um, there's some stuff shifting around um, reserves and funding and inspections and engineering right now with the tragedy that happened in Florida. So our team is participating in those conversations, trying to make sure that as stuff um, changes in our industry, we're able to bring that back to you. Transparency, you're receiving your um, financials, everything's available document-wise online for your owners. And, you know, it's really important too that um, the respect for your board and your committee's times too. We try to operate things during business hours so that you all can enjoy your time with your family and your loved ones as well. So a few things that we, you know, hope that um, you understand from our managers is, you know, our managers are here to partner with you and we are here to protect you as a board member. We, we have an obligation to act in the best interest of the corporation, but we do so by working hand in hand with the boards to do that. Um, our managers are going to help you make educated decisions. That's what those issue summaries for are for in your board packets. Make sure that there's that information is laid out in a way that allows you to feel comfortable about a decision. We're going to help you uphold the rules and, and create a relationship with you and your community to make sure that and we can improve communication and, you know, constructive feedback is always welcome. Owners, you know, this is, this is a little more challenging. This is definitely um, probably uh, a big portion of our job is spent educating owners on what does it mean to live in a community association? Why do you live in a community association? Um, what does a community association do? a fair amount of our time is spent educating those owners. And, um, you know, the, the goal for that is to keep, to engage them, to keep them informed, for them to understand why are they paying assessments and why, um, you know, who are these volunteers and what are the decisions that they're making and, and almost humanize that process a little bit so that the, try to reduce the amount of friction as much as possible with some of those interactions. And so it's important to um, understand that we're communicating what those expectations are for the individual owner to them as well. 
So at the end of the day, you are running a business. So how do you effectively run that business? If your role as a board is to make sure that you are making decisions so we can carry out the day-to-day, how does that happen? So communication is super important. And I think one of the important things to understand is that the statute in Oregon says that all decisions made by the board of directors has to be made, they have to be made in an open meeting. And that open meeting has to be available for board for all owners to observe the debate. And so there isn't a requirement for you as a board to say provide a town hall or a forum for owners. We always encourage it. However, the only statutory requirement is that the board of directors make decisions in an open meeting and that the owners have the ability to attend that meeting. Sometimes this can get tricky. If we have things that have to happen between board meetings, um, we don't wanna be sending emails and having all of the board members replying all to those emails because you've now violated the open meetings regulation because you're now having an email board meeting where you are debating something. So if there's something that our uh, manager needs a decision on in between board meetings, The process that they'll generally follow is to send that issue summary and ask for the board to make a decision, but that that decision be communicated only to the manager. And we can only move forward if there's unanimous consent. And so if you have three board members and, you know, hey, we have this dying tree, landscaper has a tree to replace it, it's going to cost you $250. Do you want to move forward? If all three board members email back to our manager and say, yes, we would like to replace the tree then the manager can proceed with that action. But if one person dissents from that decision and says, you know, I'm not sure we need a tree there. I think we should talk about this at the next board meeting. Then we would table that to the board meeting and put that on as an agenda item. If the decision is made, then what's put on the next agenda is to ratify that decision. And then in that open board meeting, we'll generally touch on what they're ratifying. So you may ratify a few things and here's what we're ratifying. These were the emergency decisions made in between the board meeting. And then we're documenting those decisions in that board meeting. So communication is really important, but making sure that we're communicating within the boundaries of the regulations is important. And that's also where that single point of contact comes into play that the board can delegate certain authorities to that single point of contact, it's generally the president, but it doesn't have to be. And they can delegate those authorities to that individual so that that individual may have the ability to make certain types of approvals for emergency repairs under certain dollar levels. And that means the manager can go to them in between those board meetings and get those decision made. And then those decisions would be documented in the following um, meeting and recorded in the minutes. The the basic legalese of you as an individual board member is really to understand that you have a duty of care and you have a responsibility to act with fiduciary care for that corporation. And understanding those things really is the basics of the legal terms that you need to know as a board member. The rest you're really going to leave up to the experts. You're going to leave up to our manager, or if you know if we're outside of our bounds, we're going to bring in the attorney to give you advice. Effective meetings, sticking to the agenda, making sure you know. Um, sometimes board members can get pretty exhausted of you know why are our meetings three hours long. A lot of times that happens because there's a lot of owner participation happening in those meetings and it drags the the conversation on. And so helping to run effective meetings really helps you as a board and helps your community to stick to the agenda, move through the decisions. Um, I think that this has gotten a lot. This is one of the things that I think has probably um, improved with COVID. Having virtual meetings definitely doesn't lend to as much social interaction Um, as having everybody in the same room, um, which has its drawbacks too, to not be able to see and connect with people um, isn't always amazing either, but it has in most instances made the meetings run much smoother for our communities. And then 
Our rulemaking and policy and financials, we actually hold a separate training for those because those are things that we kind of do a deeper dive on. And so if you're interested in those, we do have some of those previous sessions up on our YouTube channel, um, or we'll be holding these sessions again in the fall and you're welcome to attend those sessions in the future. So communication, you know, board to board, board to manager. Again, I just wanna to touch on the fact that if you're communicating as a board and you are replying all, you run the risk of violating the open meetings law. And so we really recommend that board to board communication be limited um, to the extent that's possible. If you have a question for one board member, you're the president, treasurer is approving something, you have a question about that, you can email the treasurer, but don't, when you start copying the full board is when you start to violate that open meetings law. And when you're emailing the manager and you're copying everybody, again, you're violating that open meetings law. Um, board to owner communication is really generally going to run through us. Some of our boards prefer, you know, they have their own email address set up and um, sometimes owners can communicate directly to that email address, but generally most of the board's owner communication is flowing through us. There may be something you want us to communicate to the owners, and so we're drafting that, sending it out, and helping facilitate that. And owner to owner communication, a lot of this is happening, you know, there's various different ways that this happens for communities. Some, some have Facebook pages, some have Google Drive, some have, um, you know, communication on Nextdoor. There's a lot of ways that this can happen. Um, but most of it happens, you know, in person at meetings, conversation to conversation, neighbor to neighbor. So some tips for your meetings. Again, the purpose of the meeting is to make decisions. It's not, it's not a social hour to kind of get together and, you know, catch up on vacations and things of that nature. It's really to make decisions and to set policy and then to provide some staff updates. Uh, the agenda is generally set with the president approved in advance, and then the board packets are sent out, you know, five, seven days prior to those meetings. It's really, really helpful if you review that board packet and you have questions to ask them before the meeting. That kind of gives the manager the opportunity if they need to call the expert and ask them that question that they can then have the answer for you at the meeting. Some tips for your meeting, um, again, kind of touching on Robert's rules of order. These are some really simple ways to just say, um, you know, how do we make a motion? Um, if you've got kind of endless debate going on, Robert's rules of order has some great tools on sort of calling the question, which means calling for the motion. So for those of you on the call that are presidents that um, sometimes have to kind of corral your board those are some great tools and those will again be in our PDF that we'll send you, which are some just really quick, easy tools on how to use Robert's Rules of Order. Executive session. So what can you go into executive session for and when are you going to use it? So executive session, you can go into for action against an owner, um, which is generally collections or compliance, a legal matter, staffing issues. Um, and if you have, um, most of you aren't going to have staff. So, you know, having a staffing issue isn't generally going to be something that you're going into, but action against an owner or complying or um, collections issues are, are a little tricky because action against an owner doesn't mean if an owner has a compliance issue and they want to have a hearing that doesn't suddenly become executive session. Um, action against an owner generally is resulting when the board is take, getting some type of legal advice around that situation. So um, don't confuse that if you take any action against an owner that you can go into executive session because sometimes those conversations are uncomfortable, but they do have to happen in an open meeting. And so um, if you're convening into executive session, it really needs to be most of the time it's for taking, you know, legal advice, protecting your attorney client privilege, you're talking about a collection matter with an owner, um, or you're talking about a staffing issue, um, negotiation of contracts, those really are the issues you go into executive session for. And in order to go into executive session, you have to have a unanimous consent from the board. So motion has to be made to go into executive session, you convene into executive session, Debate can happen in executive session, but decisions can't. And so once the board maybe is at the point where you believe that you can move forward and make a decision, then a motion would be made to get out of executive session. 
and you would record that motion in the open meetings. And it's tricky because if you're dealing with a legal issue, you may want to be careful about the motion that you record in the minutes. And so if you're consulting with your attorney, the motion in the minutes may be as simple as um, I move to approve the action discussed in executive session with the association's attorney. And then you have a second and then you have the approval and the move forward. There doesn't have to be the detail because what you want to avoid is you don't want to disclose the items that were discussed confidentially in executive session, but you do have to record that there is some action being taken by the board. So there's a fine balance there that you have to navigate. At nights and weekend meetings, um, this is a pretty standard thing with all of our clients. We really work to protect our manager's time and ask that meetings are held during business hours so that they can have time with their families and you can have time with your families. And we find that um, decisions are um, a little more thought out when we have the meeting during times in which all of our brains are a little fresher. So hopefully I haven't scared you all too much. Um, the important thing to understand is, again, you are unpaid volunteers. And that distinction of being unpaid, what that protects you in Oregon is that you won't be held liable. Um, so unless you are grossly negligent or you are intentionally um, misconduct, that you are protected under the Nonprofit Act, you are protected by your directors and officers and your association's liability insurance. So it's really important that um, the, uh, you know, there's a lot of requirements and there's certainly a lot of things that are responsibilities of the board members, but we don't want to scare you too much. There is protections for you as well. So when you go into executive session, um, does it mean that the board leaves the room and meets privately? Yes. Yeah. So if you have owners that are, if you're on a Zoom meeting, if you have owners that are on that Zoom call, um, then those owners would need to leave the meeting. Um, and the board, um, generally most executive sessions, our managers are participating in those executive sessions because there's there may be some information you need from our managers during that time period. Um, so our managers don't generally leave the room. But we, um, you know, if you have want to have a conversation as a board about our contract or things like that, sometimes our managers can be asked to step out as well. So that is the end of our structured content for today. If there are other questions, please feel free to unmute yourself. You can turn your cameras on um, and ask me anything that you may have. Okay. Well, hopefully we covered everything for you. If you have any questions afterwards, please feel free to email me or you can always email your manager as well. We really appreciate you guys giving us your time and thank you so much for being a part of our communities.